think at this point, everyone's familiar with the concept of the holiday movie. There's a million and three of them, most being made up from classical tales getting retold time and time again, but what comes to mind when I mention them? Well, probably a Christmas movie. I mean, after all, it certainly is the reigning champ of Tinseltown when it comes to just sheer numbers on the board. Rudolph, Christmas Carol, Frosty the Snowman, It's a Wonderful Life, Die Hard, The Polar Express, the list goes on. Second to that though is probably Halloween, right? Especially if you count horror movies, but well, that's less holiday themed and more kind of just pairs well, but anyway, regardless. Lots of holidays have movies. Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, May the 4th, which, you know, isn't exactly a holiday, but I'm working on it. I bet I could slip Joe a little ice cream and bam, we're set. The right food to the right people can make miracles happen. Speaking of food, one of the least acknowledged holiday movie types is the Thanksgiving movie. I mean, how do you make a movie for the holiday that's all about food? Well, there are actually a surprising number of them. Free birds, plane trains and automobiles, the Adams Family, but I'm actually not here to speak about the holiday movie as a concept or provide you with reasons why you should watch X or Y this holiday season. Instead, I want to examine a movie that I think best encapsulates one of the least discussed traditions or rather habits of Thanksgiving. A movie that New York Times A.O. Scott described as being best understood as a kind of reverse dress up disguising adult anxiety in the costumes of make-believe and fanciful spectacle. That movie, I'm sure you could guess, would be Wes Anderson's fantastic Mr. Fox. A bit of a weird movie, that is to say, eccentric, stylized, and so Wes Anderson. Today, however, I'm not going to talk about this movie as a Wes Anderson film, nor am I going to review it or evaluate the merit of it from some sort of critical point of view. Instead, I want to reframe Fantastic Mr. Fox as being a somewhat unintentionally perfect encapsulation of the awkward transitionary phase that intrinsically is tied to the Thanksgiving dinner table. Or, well, put more plainly, this is going to be an argument that Fantastic Mr. Fox is a dive into the development of personality and character that accompanies growing up. And all that, I think, can be summarized in the literary motif of moving on from the kids table. So grab your seats, say what you're thankful for, and come around to mine this year for an early Thanksgiving. English essay aside, let me first bring everyone up to speed. Now when it comes to this adaptation of the Fantastic Mr. Fox, it's loosely based on the 1974 story by the same name by Roald Dahl. And when I say loosely based, I mean extremely loosely. Wes Anderson really played around with this storyline, mostly by expanding and adding to the narrative and Boy, he added a lot. The original is a relatively simple children's story of a clever anthropomorphic fox that sneaks into the local farms of three wicked and cruel farmers known as Bogus Bunts and Bean. Mr. Fox steals food and drink from these farmers to feed his family, but one day the farmers catch on and lie in wait for Mr. Fox, failing to snuff him out, but managing to shoot off his tail and driving the foxes deep underground into tunnels. There they're trapped until Mr. Fox cleverly devises a plan to tunnel the routes that he'd taken above ground and emerge under each farmer's storehouse. They make off with more food and live happily ever after in the tunnels below with a new community of the other burrowing wildlife. They have their meal together and all is well. Now the movie, well, expanding on the plot is a bit of an understatement. Wes Anderson adds in subplots of adolescent rivalry, familial legacy, thematic beats for every character that flesh out the relationships between them, motives driving each and every action in a complex and meaningful way, narrative discourse on the nature of the universe and personal success, a pseudo guerrilla war campaign with firebombs and a shootout, and most importantly, a varied ending that strays away from the classic storybook. So there's a lot of side dishes to this meal. With these changes, Fantastic Mr. Fox becomes a deep and complex work, arguably Wes Anderson's first step into becoming the director that he is today, as this film could be seen as the moment that Wes Anderson really found his groove leading to his artistic renaissance. Though it was a commercial failure, and a failure in the accolade department, but really, who wants to go up against up at the Oscars? This story speaks though to a state of being and a time in life that I know of no other movie that could do so similarly in the exact fashion that Mr. Fox does. We're gonna get a bit more into this as we go, but Fantastic Mr. Fox the movie is in essence two stories that are intertwined thematically. It's a story of father and son. But it's not a story of father and son in the way that Beautiful Boy is, or The Judge, or Finding 
Nemo, it's simply that these characters' storylines dance with one another, thematically. Because Mr. Fox is a character that is relentlessly attempting to outfox time, if you'll pardon the pun. He's fighting to reclaim what he feels is his rightful personality. On the flip side of that coin, his son, Ash, is fighting to find a personality. The cavalcade of characters that we get in this film provide this wonderful setup to the developmental story we get. There's this charismatic, cool, yet semi-narcissistic Mr. Fox. A man so desperate to be seen and to be heard as he grapples with his age, change, and lot in life. The character of Mrs. Fox is a lighthouse in a storm that can be described as a cautious and responsible individual just as with her painting she is constantly gazing out at a storm unfolding in her husband Mr. Fox. And she's absolutely key to Mr. Fox's development, not just the passive bystander, it's her that leads to his growth more than anyone. The character of Ash is the embodiment of adolescent change to be. Ash is Mr. Fox's son and is a character entirely wrapped up in trying to figure out who they are and who they will and want to be. Ash is brash and he's loud and he lashes out as he seeks the approval and entry into a life his father led. Christopherson, the visiting family from out of town, is Ash's foil, naturally gifted in every way Ash isn't and silently soldiering on in a strange land across the river from his home while dealing with the internal familial hardships of his ill father. These are the main characters, and with additions of Kylie, Clive Badger, Rat, Bogus Bunce, Bean, Coach Skip, and Agnes, you know all the players for the story. All of these characters factor into the story in different ways, and genuinely all contribute to the narrative in meaningful ways, not just assisting the plot along, but deepening the themes. And there's a lot of themes and motifs in Fantastic Mr. Fox, like just so many. Still painting thunderstorms, I see. From surface level themes of greed and hubris personified in Bogus Bunce and Bean and Mr. Fox to an extent, to the deeper themes of existentialism and the untamable innate nature of the wild. After all, it's important to remember the Fox family are still just wild animals. I think now's a good time to state that, if you couldn't tell, this video is an exploration specifically of Mr. Fox's crisis in the movie through the metaphorical lens of the holiday of Thanksgiving. Which is fancy word talk to mean that I desperately feel there is something important, personal, and profound in the character's development and acceptance of not only getting older, but in no longer being who you were. The story's catalyst in this movie revolves around Mr. Fox having broken his promise he made at the start of the film to his wife. He breaks this promise to be what he thinks is true to himself. He promised if they lived, he'd get out of the bird game and find a steady job. And he did, for years. Well, Fox years. Miss Fox and his family needed him to grow up, or at least be responsible, but would this cost him his identity? Relegate him to being a writer with no audience in a hole in the ground where life around him simply makes him feel poor in every sense of the word. In keeping his promise to Mrs. Fox, he felt he lost part of himself, and so is accepting that transition asked of him, then embracing a malaise where nothing's particularly bad, but nothing in life is especially good either. Come see, come saw. Right, so now that we've established the basics and existential dread that permeates the story of Fantastic Mr. Fox, I'm sure you're wondering what I'm talking about with this whole kids table Thanksgiving tie-in. I mean, how does Thanksgiving even factor into any of this? Well, aside from the Rockwellian framing of certain shots, and the general fall vibes of the warm orange-yellow tones in the movie's palette, and oh, the food choice of the Fox family being the oh-so-classic fall feast foods of fowl and fragrant apple cider, and hey, that was some fantastic alliteration, don't you think? <laughs> Anyway, I gotta ask that you bear with me, because to start, I think it's worth stating that I chose this movie because, well, what even is Thanksgiving? By that, I just mean that this holiday's a weird one, and clearly movies think so too. We're going back in time to the first Thanksgiving to get turkeys off the menu. It's a bit amorphous, and its movies are weird compared to the more conventional holiday movies of Christmas time and Halloween. It's this American holiday celebrated most famously just here. Though also Canada, Granada, St. Lucius, Liberia, and unofficially countries like Brazil and the Philippines, and it's also observed in the Dutch town of Leiden and in the Australian territory of Norfolk Island, which is a weird spread, but it's a weird holiday. 
It's dated smack dab in the middle between those aforementioned giants of Halloween and Christmas. It's not a total non-holiday though, I mean, heck, it's even got its own parade every year. This movie though, sort of really tries to find what the holiday is at its core. While not an explicit Thanksgiving movie, it was clearly marketed as such, intentionally being released on Thanksgiving in 2009, though that didn't help it financially seeing as it opened at number 8 behind uh, Planet 51? And a Christmas Carol! You've got to be kid. So yeah, Thanksgiving movies can't even have their own holiday without Christmas muscling in on it, but Fantastic Mr. Fox goes for it anyway. Or, well, it goes for a lot of things. I mean, this story's about a lot of things. It's a Wes Anderson movie. It's, it's a busy movie, okay? But I think it really hits the nail on the head for how oddly introspective this holiday is. It's a holiday to get together with friends or family, oftentimes the ones you don't necessarily want to get together with and reflect on the year. But it's November. The year's not over, but it is coming to a close. There's one last hurrah to be had with the holiday season of December, but time's ticking. So you sit there, stuff your face, and suffer the Spanish Inquisition into who you are now, what your life plans are, your wants, fears, dreams, desires, and so much more, and all in front of your extended family and friends from the neighborhood. What fun! I mean, who doesn't want to be grilled by their diametrically opposed estranged uncle on all the things they think you're doing wrong, or justify your lifestyle, your choices, careers, schooling, passions, and more? Yourself on display and critiqued in front of everyone, questions flying at you you as you're in the hot seat of the dinner table. Unless you're not at that table. Maybe you're safe from this dreaded inquisition, maybe you're at the kids table. For a great many households, there's this unspoken tradition. It's not in any Thanksgiving handbook or a real logical aspect of the process, but many families have a kids table. Now, don't let the name fool you. It's not always this table just to place babies and young children. I mean, sure, sometimes it's purely an age thing, but often the kids table has the widest variety of age. It's this modern French salon of inquisitive minds brought together from little Timmy who's five and shoved a crayon up his nose to your older cousin that's in his late teens and won't take his headphones out. Sometimes even people in their 20s are still sat there right alongside you. It's this relegated position where the rules of who exactly sat there varies from house to house, family to family. Family. Maybe you're just there until about 13-ish and can join the big boy table when you're not a kid anymore, strictly speaking. Maybe 18's freedom and you can vote so you deserve a seat at the adult table. Or maybe it's not until you're out of college or dating or engaged bringing this significant other with you or until someone dies that your family makes room for you. Who knows, it's really an arbitrarily decided thing, but what's important is that in a way, it's a concise expression of where you are in life. Or rather, it can be an expression of where others still see you. A holdover in a dynamic from when you were a different you. I mean, is that same kid that sat at that table at seven years old still the person you are years later? Well, obviously not literally, but for people who maybe only see you once, twice, thrice a year in your extended family, you likely are no different. Like I said, it's a strange thing but the table for some can honestly be a safety net. You don't have to enter the political ring with your crazed uncle or be grilled over your life choices or what your current hairstyle is or anything else over your meal. Or at least maybe it offers you some reprieve from that grilling you've gotten all night. The kids table can be safe. You get to stay the semi-static, often idyllic and uncomplicated version of yourself in the eyes of those around you. When you stay there, there can be less argument. You get to keep a confidence and understanding in the dynamics that exist. Something that you might lose in migrating to the next stage, to the adult table. But I guess that begs the question, what's so bad about that? Fantastic Mr. Fox, or rather Mr. Fox himself, embodies a great many things, not the least of which are the existential anxieties that can keep one up at night. The fears that the best days are behind us, that you've peaked, that we are not now as great or as fantastic as we once were. This thread of concern for age and time and perception of those around us in our family and friends is made clear in many ways, but I think really ties into the concepts found in the holiday of Thanksgiving, but is not otherwise addressed in other Thanksgiving movies. Usually a Thanksgiving movie is focused on the stress of the holiday, getting the turkey made, making it to the dinner itself. I mean, it's a one night event that for many requires travel or preparation days in advance, and so that tends to be the focus. So 
some movies focus on the myths and stories that accompany Thanksgiving, of the first Thanksgiving, pilgrims joining natives of the New World in open embrace. Supposedly. And some movies are adjacent to the holiday itself. They use the meal as a bit of a set piece in the rom-com or the football movie, and that's gonna be a scene that you get. But in Fantastic Mr. Fox, we get instead a story focused on the ever-present impact of time and the anxieties of this impact contained within the story that keeps those same holiday hallmarks of the food, family, friends, and feast. Where everyone gathers around and finds community at the table, and where they find a sense of thankfulness for what they have beyond what maybe they aspire for. Where we end this movie with this thankfulness for one another and for finding a new coexistence between naturalistic wild impulses of youth and the domesticated resilience and peace that can come with age. We get the tension of changing generations as Mr. Fox sees himself in his nephew more than his son. He fails, at least initially, to connect with what's new in his son and with what's different. It's this constant contention between these characters of Ash and Mr. Fox, and it's all backdropped in a midlife crisis for Mr. Fox, with him needing to let that next generation in and let them have the spotlight to change what stage he performs on, to move beyond what he once was, and to find a new spotlight for himself to grow under, or at the very least, evolve under. He needs to leave the kids' table. The kind of growing up we're talking about in this movie is distinct. It's not a coming of age story, nor is it a going quiet into that sweet night type tale of getting older. It's an evolution of the self, and finding a sense of self in the life you inhabit. Mr. Fox's goal is not to steal chickens, or cider, or any of the heists that he performs. He isn't in it for the ill-gotten gains, he's not even in it for the thrill. Not really, at least. Mr. Fox is in a midlife crisis of time flowing past him and wanting to ensure that he still has a voice to confirm to himself that what he thinks and says and does still matters. And that's plain to see from one of the earliest scenes we get, a sequence that repeats throughout the movie, Mr. Fox's column. Mr. Fox worries that no one's reading it, no one cares, and why should they? It's a rag. He doesn't value the work he does as a newspaper man. He views it is something he had to settle for. When he made his deal with Mrs. Fox all those years ago, he promised to find new work, and this work leaves him unfulfilled. He feels his talent is wasted. Mr. Fox is a good writer, or at the very least, his writing is open and honest, and when you take the time to read his article that we see for all of a collective five seconds on screen, so you'd be forgiven for not reading it, it becomes clear how he knows that no one is reading it. These articles he writes are cries for help, they're sorrowful assessments of his life and view of himself. He even ends his article by stating, I'm not the fox I used to be, not by choice, but these days when I look at myself in the mirror I try to keep a straight face. At some point, maybe, I won't feel the need to look away. It's bitter and tragic and an encapsulation of a man worried that he's past his prime, that he isn't who he was. He's constantly looking out upon a horizon of a life he once had and wishes to have again, not simply because he was good at it, but because it's when he was happy, both when looking out at Bogus Bunts and Beans farms, but also looking at new arrivals in Christofferson, a character who Mr. Fox sees himself in and wishes a vicarious life through in a way he's never been able to get from his son, Ash. He sees a young him, and he misses it. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Fox isn't wrong. He isn't the fox he once was. Not to get too philosophical, but to quote Heraclitus, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. Time moves on, but as this movie shows, that isn't a bad thing. And that is what I think is so wonderful, so fantastic about this movie. It pulls focus constantly into the limitations of time, referencing the speed at which fox years pass compared to our own. And in doing so, underscores the sense of dread Mr. Fox has developed, but as we move through this story, Mr. Fox grows. He learns to move on, or at the very least, finds his new sense of self. It's not even really moving on, I guess, so much as it's evolution, which sounds like synonyms and can be, but I think the point I'm getting at here is that this is a story telling its audience that it's okay to change, it's okay to grow up. At seven and a half non-fox 
Fox years old, he, through the course of this film, grapples with who he has become and who he can still be. It will never be the same again. But that's okay. Everyone from his youth, his wife, Rat, Coach Skip, they're all getting older. Time's passing by, and they can't keep dancing these same dances forever. Mr. Fox is aware of this. He's very self-aware and recognizes in himself that he only seems to feel good when he's wowing people. When they're amazed and a little intimidated by him, he feels good. It's a childish desire, but he wanted to hold on to it out of fear. To move beyond that, or at least better balance that in life, he needed to learn to accept that he is something new. Though, this should not be confused with being something diminished. As all these fantastic fox years fly by, he is no longer the fox he once was. Champion of the Whackbat field, best bird thief in the game, but that does not mean he's no longer the fantastic Mr. Fox. He instead finds his new purpose in helping those around him, and in finally fulfilling the fatherly role he had been grappling with since first getting caught with Mrs. Fox. In saving the day and finding a new way forward that balances his wild tendencies with his domestic necessities, Mr. Fox allows for his relationship to grow with his family. He cracks the code and ultimately delivers the message of this story and this video. It's okay to leave the kid's table. It's okay to grow up. Now, that might sound like a simple tagline and really obvious and corny and maybe it is. But I would argue today's media has such a focus on youth, and a focus on making the most of those best days, or having lost those best days, be it from the pandemic, socioeconomic hardship, or just that you internalize the idea that they passed you by, in a day and age where 30 is marketed as the new 60 on social media, it seems important to recognize that even if fox years pass by quickly, that doesn't mean your life is over. It's okay to become something new and get up from that table to take a new seat elsewhere. I suppose what I wanted to explore in this video is the notion that it's not only okay to be getting older, but also that in the complexities of life, it's important to recognize you are a perpetually changing individual. Your personality will shift and alter what you value will likely change at some point, and that's not a bad thing. Nor does it mean that everything must change. Certainly, it's important to not lock out your old self. You can't grow by cutting off your roots. That doesn't mean you don't trim some limbs off the tree sometimes to make way for new growth. Pruning is important, but it's equally important to accept that growth is life. Just as Ash deals with the frustrations of accepting himself as different and small and not like his father and finding his path that can be all his own, so too does Mr. Fox accept that his path cannot stay focused in the past. This change and acceptance of himself as the new him is not something that anyone else can make happen for him. He has to make the conscious decision to move on and to grow, just as Ash has to accept the parts of himself that make him not just different, but him. Within this movie is a beautifully illustrated understanding of what it means to be passing the torch and turning the page, becoming something more as you build on yourself. The old Mr. Fox is never truly gone. We see that in the grocery store that sells Bogus Buns and Beans own food. He still is slyly getting away with his stealing of goodies for him and his family, he's just balanced it into a more responsible approach, one that accommodates his family with his soon-to-be two children to feed. And unlike the first time, he's way more prepared to learn he has a kid on the way. He's grown, and he's taken his seat at the adult table. This has been one of my weirder videos. Maybe it's the holiday spirit or the seasonal blues that tend to always make me all wistful and definitely melodramatic, but I really do think this movie's messaging is important nowadays. It recognizes the goodness in aging in a way that's kind of rare to ever hear in at least my experience, and it makes important note that the change needs to come from within, else you end up stuck in your ways like the farmers, who in the original ending of this book were left chasing the foxes forever, as the animal animals moved on into their happy, content, underground life, Mr. Fox tells the reader, and as far as I know, they're still waiting. They remained obsessed in their past encounters and failed to move on to grow as individuals. And in doing this, they miss the fact that Mr. Fox is still getting his way. The immature obsession with what was or with what happened in the past will always keep you sat 
at the kids' table. Referring to A.O. Scott once more, I think he sums up what I mean when it comes to what this type of movie conveys as a message in terms of growing up. He notes that sometimes we make too much of the division between generations, which is, after all, not a gap, but a continuum. Every adult is a former child, just as every child is an incipient adult, and at their best, children's film and entertainment is an attempt to communicate across the distance. I really love this movie for a whole bunch of reasons, and I think in making this video I wanted to reach across the same distance to open the conversation that growing up is okay. Maybe I wanted that conversation because I thought someone needed to hear that, and maybe it's because I think I needed to hear that, or because I think that a past version of me needed to hear that because I feel I've been in a quarter-life crisis since I was 10, and I don't necessarily think I'm alone in feeling that, and maybe it's a totally normal thing everyone's felt at some point or other, or maybe it's exasperated by the impacts of social media and a pandemic that took away years. In any event, I don't know if I'll leave the metaphorical kids table just yet this year, and maybe you won't either. Like I said, it can be scary, but I think more importantly, it can be exciting and new, and the conversation probably gets better at the other table. And you really get to come into your own that way, and be yourself, and have more say in things, and you know what? Growing up sounds, well, sounds pretty fantastic. Thanks for stopping by.